Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? All right, perfect. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the People's Forum. If you haven't been here before, we are a space for political education and cultural work. If you've been here before, welcome back. Always happy to have you. Um, today, we're here for a Science Against Capitalism uh, seminar series, which is an amazing series that aims to bring the science and technology education into conversation with people in struggle, people and movements that are in the struggle, and also aiming to break the siloing between scientific fields. Um, this series have been, has been put on with the amazing support of Eco-Socialist Horizons, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, which are both really amazing journals. We actually have some copies of them on my desk. I'll bring them out for you so you can grab some soon, as well as Science for the People. I'm honored, I'm really honored today we have two amazing guests for this great seminar, math, math, Mathematics and the Technology Industry. If anyone is like me, I absolutely flunked out of math both in middle, high school, and college. Um, but I'm really, really, really honored and excited for this conversation today, especially because of our amazing guests. Um, so first we have Professor Michael Harris, who's a professor of mathematics at Columbia University. He previously taught at Brandeis and for 20 years at the Université Paris 7. He also spent one semester teaching at Bethlehem University in Palestine and a year as a visiting researcher at the Steklov Institute of Mathematics in Moscow. In the mid-1980s, he worked for Science for the People to organize Science for Nicaragua, which from 1986 to 1990, he sent teachers to Nicaraguan universities. He is the author of Mathematics Without Apologies and has written extensively on political and cultural questions related to math. And his Substack newsletter, which I highly recommend you check out, um, Silicon Reckoner, comments on the implications of mathematics of new technologies. We also have our amazing moderator, Nile Kumar, who is a data scientist with a background in mathematical physics. He studied mathematics and physics at Columbia University and holds a PhD in mathematics from Northwestern University. He's involved with Science for the People and the Sunrise Movement, and you, you could often find him reading at the People's Forum. So with that, I'm really honored to have you both here today, and thank you everyone for joining us and for our comrades online. I'm going to give a quick rundown. So we have some folks joining us online, so when it comes time for a question and answer, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you so our folks online can hear us. Sound good? Give me a thumbs up. Perfect. All right, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Nile. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, it's always uh, surprising, I think, like Michael said earlier off camera, uh, to see so many people show up, you know, non-mathematicians show up for, for math, like Saidi said. It's uh, often a bit scary. Uh, I think, you know, one of my favorite parts about Michael's book, uh, Mathematics Without Apologies, is... is uh, a theme that runs through it is like, how would you explain mathematics uh, at a dinner party? Uh, and you know, this is a serious problem, right? Like, how, how do you do it? Uh, it's quite difficult. And you know, for me, maybe the the conversations aren't usually as uh, they, they don't go as well as they do in in this book. I think for me, it's usually, oh yeah, I, I do I do math, and the response is something like, oh god, like I, I hated math, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, so hopefully today uh, we can get to talking about uh, the profession of pure mathematics, a little bit about pure mathematics itself, and how it ties into uh, what we've been discussing so far in this series of lectures on uh, science against capitalism. Um, so maybe uh, I'll, I'll try to give a very brief overview of sort of what is pure mathematics and then try to uh, sort of uh, uh, hand it over to Michael with, with, with you know, uh, keeping that in mind. Um, so I, I think probably all of us are pretty familiar with, you know, what is math, generally speaking. Uh, it might be kind of hard to define uh, precisely. I don't know if I could do that. Um, but I think we're all pretty familiar with, you know, uh, sort of uh, what is math. And, and so pure math um, is a particular sort of subset, subfield of math. Uh, I think maybe the name gives you a hint, right? And pure math sort of uh, uh, sets itself in opposition against applied math, right? Pure math is math which is done um, not necessarily with uh, a particular, you know, real-world aim, a goal, production, profit, something like that in mind. Um, and in that sense, it's often a little bit different than the other sciences. Um, uh, a lot of people compare it, you know, say, say pure math is a little bit closer to art uh, often in, in some senses than, uh, than the sciences. But uh, maybe just sort of keep that in mind as we talk about math 
uh, against capitalism because uh, if math is, you know, if pure math has no particular profitability, commodifiability, then what does it mean? Uh, you know, what, what role does math play in class struggle, in striving for a, a better, a socialist future? Um, but before we get into that, maybe let me uh, give a quick sort of rundown of a couple examples of like, what is it that pure mathematicians think about? Because I think uh, um, math is a bit more obscure than, for instance, the other talks we've had on, on soil sciences and, and much more concrete things. Um, so a couple examples, you know, math like biology is uh, comprised of a bunch of different subfields. Uh, often the subfields are, are quite different, quite far apart. Uh, some, I think, mathematicians in certain subfields might be, you know, might find it easier to talk to a biologist than they might, uh, you know, find it to, to talk with a, another mathematician. But uh, to give a quick example, um, you know, my uh, graduate work was in mathematical physics. So, uh, again, a, a pretty big subfield in and of itself, but uh, I in particular studied some of the mathematical ideas that were coming out of what physicists were trying to understand, putting, trying to put together a theory of quantum gravity, string theory, whatever it might have been, trying to understand some of those, uh, the mathematical aspects and, and features of what those physicists were doing. Um, you know, and another example is, is the subfield of, of topology, which uh, very roughly speaking is the study of shape uh, and uh, often topologists spend time thinking about, you know, uh, if I have two shapes that are a priori distinct, are they equivalent to each other in the sense that I can take one shape and sort of smoothly, continuously deform it into another shape, right, uh, without ripping or tearing it? So that's that's some of the ideas of topology, and and there's also you know the 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 really old and not very funny joke that is often told about topologists, which is that they you know drink coffee from a donut because they can't really tell the difference between a, a mug and a donut. Um, and then, they, <laughs> uh, and then maybe, you know, uh, I can say a word about number theory, although maybe talking about number theory in, in front of Michael is, is a bit silly, but, um, uh, you know, number theory often, some of the big problems in number theory uh, often can be understood by someone in middle school, someone in you know elementary school, right? Questions about prime numbers, right? Can, can you show that any uh, even number greater than two can be written as the sum of two primes, right? Um, I believe this problem, which is still open, had a, a million dollar prize at some point a couple of years ago. Um, so the, some of these problems are, are uh, quite easy to state, very simple sounding but incredibly difficult once you get down to trying to understand, you know, how do I approach this problem? Um, so th that's maybe three quick examples uh, of what mathematicians might uh, uh, think about. And I, I hope they give you uh, a sense of how these problems are not anchored uh, with, you know, material reality necessarily, right? <laughs> Figuring out if numbers can be written as sums of primes maybe in 200 years we'll have some deep <laughs> significance with uh, uh, technology, but that's certainly not the aim uh, when, we're, when we're approaching math, uh, pure math. So just a, a quick reminder then with that in mind on the aims of this series of lectures, right, is, is science against capitalism, which we can think of maybe in, in sort of a, a two ways, one being to get uh, those of us who uh, are envisioning a socialist future interested, g get us interested in science, right? And try to understand what sci how science can contribute uh, to the struggle. And then sort of on the flip side as well, trying to get those who are uh, scientists or interested in going into science, um, interested in, you know, trying to integrate that, that, that struggle into their work. Uh, as difficult uh, or as scary as that may be sometimes, and also trying to make sure that, you know, we, we're building spaces for scientists uh, who, uh, of a like mind, uh, to collaborate and talk to each other, especially cross, cross fields. Ma I feel like mathematicians often are, are particularly siloed um, when it comes to the sciences. So with all that said, uh, and uh, with that in the back of our minds, I'll, I'll pass it over to Michael to talk about 
a bit about you know what 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 is radical mathematics uh, is there a thing as radical mathematics if if mathematics is not so easily commodifiable well thank you for that introduction Okay, and how about this? Okay, this, everything turned off. All right. So this is just the outline, and you can... Uh, part three is uh, an attempt to explain something in number theory, but I think we may actually want to skip that when you, when you see what it says. Uh, why is it not... Oh, okay. I've been reorganizing this uh, and just today, I saw an article by Ted Chiang at the beginning of May. I guess everybody has noticed that there is a lot of talk about uh, the dangers of AI and what can be the implications of AI, the promises of AI, and what can be done about it. And it turns out, and this is as surprising to me as it is to anybody, that it's a, it's a good moment for scientists to question capitalism. And here is, here's Ted Chiang, a, science fiction, a great science fiction writer, uh, wrote something that I would not have expected to see. So this is from the middle of an art, his article in which he compares AI to, to McKinsey, which is where it's, I'm not going to explain why that, but why that is. He writes, whenever... Anyone accuses anyone else of being a Luddite, it's worth asking, is the person being accused actually against technology or are they in favor of economic justice? And is the person making the accusation actually in favor of improving people's lives or are they just trying to increase the private accumulation of capital? Now, I have been called a Luddite because of uh, precisely... Uh, for the reasons that are indicated there, is the people who have accused me are not talking about uh, improving people's lives. They are mainly saying, you know, technology follows its own uh, trajectory, and all we can do it's, is 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 uh, adjust. All we can do is adjust. So, if you, and if you deny that, then it's easy to call you a luddite. And then he says, he, the next paragraph. Today we find ourselves in a situation in which technology has become conflated with capitalism, which has in turn become conflated with a very notion of progress. If you try to criticize capitalism, you are accused of opposing both technology and progress. But what does progress even mean if it doesn't include better lives for people who work? Now he's a, he's a real writer, so he puts this in a very clear and convincing way. He, if you read the article, you'll see he doesn't, he's not quite ready to criticize capitalism as such, but if you look at his arguments, you can put together a very, uh, a very uh, viable critique of capitalism. And this is something, this is something that's, uh, as I say, something somewhat surprising in the moment in which even the people in OpenAI and in uh, uh, Google are w sending warnings. It's a, it's a, it's a moment to, to, uh, to call, call certain uh, certain uh, assumptions into question. So now, as uh, Neela said, wh why? How is it even possible to talk about radical mathematics? Well, here's a, here's a history. Well, this maybe is not terribly terribly convincing. There, you've got Archimedes being Archimedes being killed by a by a Roman soldier, wh whom he says, "Get out of my get out get out of my light! You're disturbing my circles." And a Roman soldier is not uh, is not used to taking that kind of hearing that kind of talk. And on the other, the next one, there's Hypatia, who is, if you can see, very yeah, right there. It's being drawn from her carriage by Christians. This is uh, this is Hypatia, the 
pagan scientist, the uh, defender of reason against this ob obscurantist Christian. This is from a, a, an, an engraving from 1700, the beginning of the Enlightenment, when uh, Hypatia was rediscovered. And moving to m less ancient and more credible examples of radical mathematics, Galois, age 19, uh, in 1831, he toasted the king brandishing a dagger to Louis-Philippe if he turns traitor. And for this, he was arrested. This was in a tavern. Uh, that he, then he was released, but later, b because he was a Republican in, in, in a monarchy, uh, he was the victim... According, it, it, what actually happened is not so clear, but he, he was the victim of a conspiracy uh, that led to his death in a duel, which you see in the, uh, in the right corner of the screen. There's actually a movie which shows him, age 20, writing his notes on algebraic equations that made him a pioneer in algebra, one of the most important algebraists in history. And, and uh, he's a very romantic figure. Everybody who becomes a mathematician hears this story early on, and, and if it doesn't discourage you from becoming a mathematician, then that's a sign that you, your values may, you may have the right values for today's, for today's uh, talk. And I think, and there, there's another, there's a, a uh, I think it's an ex exhibition, The Rebellious Mathematician, and story of a revolutionary mathematician. You can talk about a revolutionary mathematician as long as the person was killed in a duel in 1832. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good precedent. Okay. Here's a 19th century Russian radical, Sofia Kovalevskaya, the first woman to obtain a PhD in mathematics, one of the first women to obtain a PhD in any subject, the first professor in any subject in, in Northern Europe, and she was part of a radical family. She, the, her history is, is worth studying. In 1871, she traveled to Paris to participate in the Paris Commune, where her sister was uh, taking active part. So she was, uh, and she died of uh, tuberculosis at an early age. Otherwise, we would, more people would know about her. In the 20th century, an example uh, from the Science for the People magazine uh, Maurice and Josette Audin. Uh, Maurice Audin was, uh, a, was a, a supporter of Algerian independence. He was teaching in, a, in Algeria, a communist, as was uh, his wife Josette. And uh, during the Battle of Algiers, he was arrested by the paratroopers and tortured and died under torture. The French uh, government for decades claimed that he had escaped and they didn't know what had happened to him. He Finally, just a few years ago, I think in 2018, Macron admitted, uh, that's in the, there's an article from the Wall Street Journal that, that, he, was, uh, that he was tortured to death. And as you see, uh, there is a square named after him with his, with, uh, maybe you can see a, a, a statue and, and, a, and a picture in Algiers, where the uh, Hirak, uh, if you, you, you know you were following the, the uprising uh, in, in Algeria uh, a few years ago, they would meet every day in this square named after him. And there's also a square named after him in, in Paris. Uh, here is... The, now the, the, I'm talking about f French mathematicians, because, in part because I lived in France and I had a lot of uh, colleagues who were active in various movements, but also because there is a tradition, maybe starting with Galois. Uh, Godemont was uh, an important mathematician, and he's explaining his refusal to attend a 1971 conference sponsored by NATO, and here's my uh, translation. If we believe we can accept money for, from anyone for the sake of mathematics, if we act as if we agree with politicians who think that science and education are mere branches of the military, how can we then hope to recover the respect of the young or of ourselves? A mathematician's ultimate proof of sincerity is, is willingness to give up a bit of mathematics 
not to mention funding out of respect for a moral code. And this was, uh, he managed to convince a number of mathematicians not to attend this, this conference because of the NATO funding. Um, Laurent Schwartz won the Fields Medal in uh, 1950, he was considered the uh, highest honor for a young mathematician under, under 40. He, was, uh, he wrote a, a, uh, an autobiography, which is largely about his, his politics, the first half in any case. He was a Trotskyist, but he remained political. Uh, this is an article about him from New Politics. And an internationalist. Uh, he joined with uh, Bertrand Russell to protest the Soviet invasion of Hungary, to crush the workers' revolution there. This is how it's written in uh, uh, the New Politics. And in 1957, he was Maurice Audin's thesis advisor. Maurice Audin had, been, had disappeared, so he was not present for his thesis defense. Um, so together with Mauriac and Sartre, he org helped to organize the committee, and the thesis defense was held in absentia, and this was quite a uh, bold step to take because the Battle of Algiers was also taking place in France. Uh, his, home was, uh, his home was firebombed, Godemont's home was firebombed by the OAS, the, the uh, terrorist military organization that uh, opposed French, uh, independence of, of uh, uh, the Algeria. And he signed the manifesto which encouraged young men to refuse to serve in the French army as long as it was in Algeria, war in Algeria. And he was suspended from teaching. So, and he, be, he was a kind of moral force for the rest of his life. Uh, even though he was a mathematician, he was, uh, his name was, was very w well known. Here's a, here's a Steve Smale, another another uh, no, uh, Fields Medalist. And this picture was just uh, shown to me recently. He's teaching during the Columbia strike in, 19, I don't know why it says 1968. Uh, and there he is. He was, uh, he went in 1966, he went to Moscow for the International Congress of Mathematicians, which is where the Fields Medals are awarded. And at that time, he was uh, called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, and then the newspapers reported that he was, he was not showing, he was not uh, responding to the summons from the House Un-American Activities Committee because he was in Moscow. And this, this led to a lot of speculation. He's, st he's still around, by the way. And here's a, a friend, personal friend, and inspiration, Chandler Davis, who died just last year. He lost his position at the University of Michigan for refusing to cooperate with the House Un-American Activities Commis Committee. And he subsequently served a six-month prison term. He was blacklisted in the United States. He moved to Toronto, where he remained the rest of his life, and he was uh, a troublemaker there. In 2014, Science for the People was revived by a very indirect uh, process. A historian named Sigrid Schmaltzer discovered a science historian at the Uni UMass Amherst discovered Science for the People, or the magazine, and thought, she's a historian of science, and she thought it would be worthwhile writing a history, you know, reporting on this. And so she convened a conference in Amherst in 2014. Many people came, former members of Science for the People, and it was so successful, people in attendance said, why do we not have an organization like that now? And so, so it is. He was there. Uh, and uh, age, well, 92. Wait, is that right? No, not 89, 88. And uh, mathematicians are not very good at arithmetic. And uh, so somebody else said, maybe we shouldn't use the word radical because it, leads, it lends itself to misinterpretation. Uh, and when she, he spoke, he said, I am radical and so are you. And younger people in the audience especially needed this affirmation. This is from a, a, a memorial piece in Science for the People magazine about him. Very nice piece, by the way, by the uh, publisher. They, we in our movement's infancy, crave the knowledge that we are not alone, that someone before us believed and still believes in an alternative to capitalist science. And he, uh, 
he died last last year, but even last summer, when he was in his hospital bed, he spoke at the Azat Miftach of Days Against the War, which is organized by this committee of mathematicians in Paris, New York, Los Angeles, and Manchester, England. Azat Miftachov uh, is a an Russian anarchist. There are such people. There is a, a left in Russia, though you don't hear much about them. He was arrested uh, with fabricated evidence. Uh, he was supposedly recognized, he was supposedly wearing a mask, but he was recognized by his expressive eyebrows. The, the witness who claimed that then disappeared and has not been heard from, but he was, con he was sentenced to six years at hard labor in, in, in a prison camp. And although he's scheduled to, to be released this year, they're coming up with new... Obviously, he's been speaking out against the war, and, uh, and he is uh, likely to be sentenced again. Now, so that's a, that's a, a, a brief history of radical mathematics to show that it is possible. Uh, now, what are uh, what can mathematics be accused of? Well, here the former French prime minister accused math 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 professors of crimes against humanity by teaching their students financial mathematics. I don't think that's a, a an inaccurate. Uh, accusation, although Rocard is maybe not in the best position to to do that because he was when he was a prime minister, his he also uh, was guilty of certain practices, questionable practices. But uh, this was at the time of the uh, crash in 2008, and some mathematicians said, no, 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 it's not the mathematicians who are, who are guilty, it's the, you know, mathematicians just teach, uh, you know, these abstract techniques, it's, it's what the uh, traders do with it, what the hedge fund uh, uh, owners do with it. But it's worth, it's worth uh, thinking about. Okay. This was this is the problem. There is a uh, group in Cambridge, England, who had a series of, of courses and discussion papers on ethics and mathematics ab about this very problem. M many mathematicians feel that mathematics is value-free. Uh, any ethical issues solely lie with the user of the tool their mathematics helps create. And many consciously exclude themselves from the issue by reducing their role to that of the discoverer of mathematics, arguing that the mathematics was always there anyway. And there's another version, which I don't think is in this, this discussion paper. People who, who justify taking uh, funds from the military saying, well, if it's going into mathematical research, then it's not going into buying weapons or developing weapons. This is a... Uh, this is a an attitude one frequently encounters among, among colleagues. And I should say, again, in France, uh, most people are, do, most of my colleagues can see through this argument. I, I, and when there were strikes or demonstrations, and there were often demonstrations and strikes in France, there would be, uh, it would be, I would always see colleagues on the uh, out out in the demonstrations, it would be a, a good place to meet, and that's a, that's a, 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 a practice, a, a habit that I, has yet to be developed widely in the United States. Although I have hope for uh, younger mathematicians, I think uh, I think it's uh, there. W it was as you saw Steve Smale in the '60s. It was it was something that that was not at all uncommon during the Vietnam War, and I think it, it can happen again. Here's an article I wrote uh, for Times Higher Education about uh, accepting money from the NSA and, and its counterpart in Britain. And it was easy for me to get it published in, in England for, for various reasons. Because again, in, in, in Britain, it's, it, there are more people who are aware of such things. Mathematics has taken its place alongside the other sciences as a source of dramatic threats to the foundations of organized human life. The explosive, and here are just a few, a few things that can be done with mathematics that one can, uh, can 
mobilize against. The explosive growth of markets and financial derivatives, erosion of privacy through corporate as well as government surveillance, targeted, targeted psychological manipulation through data mining, the supposedly objective algorithms exposed in Kathy O'Neill's book, uh, you'll see that in a moment, that are used to make judgments about us, such as our loan eligibility, that, but that actually embed various destructive biases. Mathematicians have been reluctant to recognize that if our work interests generous donors, it is often precisely because it is useful according to a definition that Hardy proposed near the beginning of the... This is G.H. Hardy, who was a pacifist. Afterwards, he, said he, he claimed to have been exaggerating with this definition, but I think it's still good. The development... It's, mathematics is useful because it's, if its development tends to accentuate the existing inequalities in the distribution of wealth or more directly promotes the destruction of human life. So this is why the donors, this is why mo many donors find it useful. This is a, right. Well, here, Pla here is Plato, <laughs> going back a few thousand years, from the Republic. He's talking about why mathematics was useful. Insofar as it pertains to war, Glaucon said, it is obviously suitable to study geometry. As regard encampments, occupation of positions, concentration and deployment of troops, and all the other formations, being a geometer or not makes all the difference. So this the the u utility of mathematics for war was recognized a very long time ago, and that's in fact uh, what Archimedes was doing on that on in Syracuse, defending against the Roman soldiers. He was devising engines of war, just uh, uh, catapults and such. And the Romans were upset that he was killed because they wanted him to be working for them. But anyway, uh, NSA. This is Tom Hales, uh, who has, is a very famous mathematician for his uh, work, among other things, on, on uh, solving the Kepler conjecture on the packing of spheres. NSA employs some of the world's greatest cryptographic minds. The NSA claims to be the largest employer of mathematicians in the United States. In my opinion, an algorithm has, that has been designed by NSA with a clear mathematical structure, uh, there's some, something missing from this sentence. Uh, it, yes, giving them exclusive backdoor access is no accident, particularly in light of the Snowden documents. This is precisely the expertly designed way to insert an exclusive backdoor back door. So this is, so Hales, who was, was not previously a political activist in any sense, saw this, decided he had to speak out, and he used his knowledge to, to make this, to, to explain in language that with uh, a relatively limited uh, background in mathematics is, is still comprehensible the principle behind the back door in the standard, the National Institute of, of Standards uh, and Technology for pseudo-random number generation. And this is, uh, this is Tom Hales. Tom Leinster is uh, uh, report, re is writing on uh, a category theorist from Edinburgh, this is from my ar article, has called the Heilbronn Institute, which is this sponsor here, Heilbronn Institute, that's the one circled. Uh, GCHQ, mathematical brand. GCHQ, uh, HQ is headquarters. I don't remember what GC stands for, but it's the, NS, it's the equivalent of the NSA in Britain. And uh, these mathematicians did not refuse funding from GCHQ. This is a, this is a problem that can, can be addressed. Here's, uh, here's Kathy O'Neill, recognizable from a distance with her, with her blue hair. Uh, it, this is a very good book, uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Algorithms determine how much we pay for insurance or what the terms of our loans will be or what kind of political messaging we receive. There are algorithms that find out the weather forecast and only then decide on the work schedule of thousands of people, which means they can't plan because the algorithm tells them when they will and will not come to work. Their popularity relies on the notion they are objective. Uh, that's a, but the algorithms that power the data economy are based on choices made by fallible human me beings. This is, this is a point that cannot be made often enough when you talk about mathematics, because everybody knows that what 
when you go to school, you get an answer, and the answer is the right answer. If you get a different answer, then it's the wrong answer. Mathematics is supposed to be objective. But, they, but these algorithms, which carry a mathematical brand, nevertheless encode human prejudice, misunderstanding, and bias into automatic systems that increasingly manage our lives, their verdicts, even when wrong or harmful or beyond dispute or appeal. Oh, this is blank because there's just too much to be said about this. And, you know, I couldn't figure out how to fill... But we, maybe we can talk about these things later, about what uh, the role of mathematics in, in, in finance and in AI and, and also in the, in the ideology that, that, that accompanies these. All right. So, very interesting. After the Snowden revelations... Uh, mathematicians started speaking out spontaneously against cooperation with the NSA. The NSA was funding a program of, of grants and it was administered by the American Mathematical Society, which is the main professional organization. And uh, Alexander Bevinson, who was a very uh, unpredictable, uh, very important but rather unpredictable mathematician who goes his own way, wrote a letter to the notices of the American Mathematical Society right after the Snowden revelations saying, and this was quoted, this was widely quoted because he's such a well-known mathematician and because it was published there, saying, uh, if any healing is possible, He's concerned about ecology, maybe more than anything else. It would probably start with making the NSA and its ilk socially unacceptable, just as in the days of my youth, working for the KGB was socially unacceptable for many in the Soviet Union. He wrote, the American Mathematical Society should shun all contacts with the NSA. And this came out at the same time I had been consulting with one of the editors of the notices of the American Mathematical Society to have a kind of survey of mathematicians in the wake of the Snowden revelations to see, uh, you know, what they thought about this pro program with the NSA. And we were, our aim was to be completely impartial, to let people speak, and it was, and these messages, the, the letters started coming in. To our great surprise, but can't say to our disappointment, it was essentially impossible to find anybody willing to defend this program of cooperation with the NSA. And so very quietly, it got terminated. The NSA saw this as uh, public relations and it was the public relations were not working. And this GCHQ, this is Tom Lenstrom whom I mentioned before, the very first opinion column published in the London Mathematical Society newsletter, and the no London Mathematical Society was created in the 19th century, early in the 19th century. But they had a newsletter, and they published an opinion which said basically the same thing. Oh, every, should mathematicians cooperate with GCHQ? And the answer uh, in several columns is uh, he didn't think so. Now, you don't have to go so far. Uh, in the United States there is a, an organization called the Just Mathematics Collective, which has, uh, which, whose first campaign was uh, letters, a petition calling for non-cooperation with the NSA. And, uh, and this, is, this is a statement. It's been widely signed by a number of people. Uh, and they didn't only do that. Uh, Every year in January, there's something called the Joint Mathematics Meetings, which uh, involves several, maybe 10,000 or more mathematicians in one, one city. And at this meeting, there's a job fair. And one of the tables is always uh, staffed by the NSA. It's, and that's the, that's the table. They organized a... Uh, a protest, and they had a they had a, 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 a banner right behind the table. And when the uh, when they were invited to leave, which was took longer than than I anticipated, uh, they basically made the table useless by 
asking questions by by taking up all the question time. So this was uh, this was, a, and they did it together with uh, one of the radical Muslim organizations in Boston. It was in Boston last uh, uh, January. So here's a quotation from my book about uh, this is about quants and about uh, uh, financial mathematics. Specifically, uh, by playing the role of provider of the appearance of scientific objectivity, mathematics indentures itself in turn to the model of scientific, scientific, scientificity that underpins the philosophy of mathematics. Our truth flows outward, clutching its warrant of incorrigibility into la larger society where it is deployed by powerful beings, that means like heads of hedge funds and Wall Street people, in what is demonstrably the only way possible. And there was an article, in, again, the notices of the American Mathematical Society publishes surprisingly radical articles. Uh, this the guy, Stein, Stein Saltz, after the, the, the financial crisis, uh, reviewed a book that was promoting the idea of, of quants, saying the uh, legitimacy exchange uh, that is to say, the mathematicians provide legitimacy because of the supposed objectivity of mathematics, and in exchange they get funding for their departments. Although, uh, perhaps it might better, better be called a credibility default swap. It's, uh, right. But it's not only applications. Here is what I say. This is also from my article. The possibility of the most visible aberrations, and here are a few, are built into the normal functioning of, of contemporary capitalism and are justified by an ideology of expertise that is maintained by our universities and research institutes. Our very existence as experts guarantees that our profession provides no refuge of ethical purity. Now, this was in an article in memory of another radical mathematician who died a, a few years ago named Ruben Hirsch. And... Uh, and uh, so we basically, the art, my, the, my article says that it uh, calls on mathematicians to take up the responsibility to, to question these, this, this ideology of expertise. And somebody came up to me at this uh, meeting in Boston, said she had read it, and said she's actually going to do that. So it's, it's worth writing, writing articles and having, having meetings like this one. And here's an article, by, again, by the ethicists in, at Cambridge. It should not be a hard argument or claim to make that the highest level of ethical practice is taking responsibility, not just of one's own actions, but also of the actions of all those in the profession. <coughs> there are mathematicians who will come to the realization that they must do it because no one else will nor can. That's what that means. That's, I'm here because I know there aren't any other mathematicians who are going to speak for science for the people, but I hope, I hope that people who are better speakers will soon be available because it's, uh, you know... The, the movement is suffering from the shortage of, of the best possible speakers. The challenge is to go beyond speaking out in a way that only other mathematicians can understand. It involves denouncing mathematics. Well, I wouldn't say denouncing mathematics as such. Denounc denouncing certain applications of mathematics. Raising ethical issues stemming, f stemming from technical mathematics in a public forum and in a language the non-mathematician can understand. Um, Maurice Kyodo is currently writing a book about this. And it's taking him a long time because really there are a lot of things, a lot of problems uh, with mathematical practice, a lot of ethical, uh, et problematic uh, applications of mathematics. Now, what is number theory about? You know, I think I'm, you're not going to see very much of this. But here is, this is what uh, Nile was talking about. I'm accustomed as a professional mathematician to living in a sort of vacuum. He's another, he's another very famous mathematician. Surrounded by people who declare with an odd sort of pride that they are mathematically illiterate. Uh, Mumford took a lot, uh, came in for a lot of criticism when he, he devoted, he, he accepted a prize uh, in Israel, but with the intention of donating his uh, the prize money to Palestinian uh, uh, organization, half of it to a Palestinian organization, the other half to an Israeli organization against the occupation. And he, and he came in for, for he was ins viciously insulted 
uh, by the, some, some parts of the Israeli press. And here's from my, from my uh, book. Uh, Gowers, I'm, I'm quoting a lot of field medalists because there's another aspect of the profession which I don't think I'll get into, which is its intensely hierarchical nature. People who, are, who have won these prizes have the... Uh, have they, everybody has the right to speak out, but, but when they speak out, people will listen to them. So he, so he published this in one of his articles. If you've ever found yourself next to a mathematician at a dinner party... Gowers once wrote, you have probably out of politeness or perhaps desperation asked what he or she works on. Uh, variants of this scenario take place in cocktail parties, on long-distance flights, more rarely at singles bars. That's my, my the, non, the, the non-italicized part is from my book. If you do not have a mathematics degree, Gowers continued, we will almost certainly have received a disappointing answer such as I work in Iwasawa theory, but it would take too long to explain to you what that is. Well, I actually have worked in Iwasawa theory, and I guarantee you don't want to, to hear about that. Uh, but it's not irrelevant to for Maslow's theorem. Um, this is from this is from uh, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. I happen to be in England in the spring of 1993 when this premiered and I saw it and at the beginning Thomasina Coverley is an extremely precocious teenager who has a, a tutor who is a mathematician and uh, this part of, half of the story is this is in eight, 18, around 1810 and the other half is taking place in the 1990s uh, in the same place, and and uh, Septimus says he wrote that he had discovered a wonderful proof of this theorem, but the margin being too narrow for his purpose did not have room to write it down. And Thomasina says, "Oh, I see now. The answer is perfectly obvious." And Septimus says, "This time you may have overreached yourself. The problem, in fact, was not solved at the time." And, and but what uh, Thomasina had seen is that there was no proof. The thing that is perfectly obvious is that the note in the margin was a joke to make you all mad, which may or may not have been true. But, in fact, it was proved. And the funny thing is that the proof was announced exactly one month after, after Arcadia premiered in, 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 in England, in Cambridge, England. And here is the proof, but I think you probably do not want to see this proof. I think I think I, I put this proof in because Nile said one of the questions was, "What is it?" The, you know, talk about mathematics. But I think Nile has explained that well enough that we can skip this. But you can see what it looks like at least. This is it. This is from a different talk. This is, this is from a from a talk for. Uh, Undergraduate mathematicians. I think math ma math majors. I think I think most of you can be spared this. But anyway, but let's talk about whether mathematics. I'm going to conclude by asking whether mathematics is pre-capitalist or post-capitalist. So anybody who has uh, been in a mathematics department, who has majored in mathematics, who has done a mathematics PhD, who has been a professor, knows that it is it is organized, the power is organized in the way it is organized in university departments in any subject, but maybe even more vertically in a sense. Uh, that is partly because you know, there is the, the, the ideology of, of mathematics and uh, presupposes that there is only white, one right answer. And to a certain extent, you know, this is accurate. I mean, if you, if you, you you know, two plus two does not equal five, and you have to, and you know if you can argue about that, but you uh, most, uh, but it's it's not it's a fruitless sort of argument. If you want to argue about, you can argue about power in, in other in other ways. But to continue, uh, nor do I need uh, to remind you how cap mathematics is used both practically in the organization of capitalist production and the centrality of the tech industry today only makes this more apparent, and ideologically to dismiss the possibility of a non-capitalist organization of society. And I found this recently. There's a, 
a an Indian a version of Chat GPT called Gita GPT, and you know uh, this per the software engineer. And this is this 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 is a particularly nice quotation. But the software engineers in all countries uh, think the same way. I just build the knives. If people want to use it to murder or to cut vegetables, that's not really in my hands, right? Right. So this is this is a uh, one. Uh, aspect of training for, for life in the, in the only in the society to which there is no alternative as Margaret Thatcher like to repeat on the other hand while none of us has a realistic well maybe if you have a realistic image of a post-capitalist society I'd like to hear it if you think it's realistic but we mostly agree that it would end, entail an end to alienation as in this excerpt from Marx from the poverty of philosophy. Finally, they came, there came a time when everything that men had considered as inalienable became an object of exchange, of traffic, and could be alienated. This is the time when the very thing which till then had been communicated but never exchanged, given but never sold, acquired but never bought, things like virtue, love, conviction, knowledge, conscience, and I, put, I added mathematics, he didn't put it there. <laughs> when everything, in short, passed into commerce, it is the time of general corruption, of universal venality, the time when everything, moral or physical, having become a marketable value, is brought to the market to be assessed at its truest value. I like this. This, is, this was said in, in various ways, in, in different, uh, uh, various texts by Marx. But this is a particularly uh, useful one to, uh, to show mathematicians who think that... Uh, the tech industry is onto something when they are claiming that they are going to automate mathematics and they are going to replace mathematicians like, like everyone else because this is, this is what they do. They are disrupting. And here, from the Communist Manifesto, this is, this is the alternative. Going back to uh, the, the, the pre-alienation. In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association which the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. Probably uh, most of you have seen this more than once. So on the occasions when I tried to imagine a post-capitalist, post-scarcity society, and I asked myself to what kind of unalienated labor the liberated people would devote its time, mathematics always seemed to me an obvious choice. Now maybe it doesn't seem to everybody an obvious choice. If you think, you don't have to work anymore. Uh, Post-scarcity, what are you going to do with your time? And, you know, why not? Mathematics is, is endless. Well, you can, you, can, you can chuckle over this. Actually, there is, there is a book that some of you may have, have read that does imagine something like this. It's the glass bead game. It's uh, basically a post-scarcity society by Hermann Hesse. And those who are particularly qualified are, uh, are, uh, you know, are organized into a society that devotes itself into something that, to some readers, looks suspiciously like, like mathematics. And there's a story that goes with this also. Uh, it's in my book. Uh, Neil Chris, who was uh, in my field, who uh, uh, at, at one point wrote a thesis, and he, then he read the glass bead game, and he said, uh, "You know, am I really just going to be devoting my entire life to uh, to an activity that so few people understand? Maybe a handful of people, twenty people at most, will understand, and that has no appreciable." Uh, effect on the on the on society. So, guess so. He decided to give up mathematics, and guess what he he decided to do. Anybody? Anybody? Yes. He became a hedge fund manager, and although he's not he's not a billionaire, I think he's he, he's he's pretty much pretty up there. And uh, the one thing, but I. 
I noticed that. Well, I won't. I won't say. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell people off, off, offline. Anyway. So, so with Marx's statement in mind, a brief history of my attempt to respond to claims that the tech industry. Here's a brief history of my. Uh, here is a brief history of my attempt to respond to claims that the tech industry will, ju- will eventually turn mathematics into an object of exchange, like, like everything else, as predicted by, as as predicted in that passage from Marx. For free, it's free. <laughs> it's free. Although, oh, oh, although the last, the last one, which was sp- specifically about how the tech industry wants to organize society, two people wrote to me saying they want to pay to subscribe, and I said, well, "I haven't. You know, that, I have not given them that option." <laughs> so here's something that I wrote: Computer scientist Scott Aronson, who was quoted on a blog at Scientific American. It's conceivable that someday computers will replace humans at all aspects of mathematical research, but it's also conceivable that by the time they can do that, they'll be able to replace humans at music and science journalism and everything else. Well, that everything else is, uh, is, is really interesting uh, because, in fact, if you question the desirable, desirability of replacing humans at everything, so at, in some quarters, and particularly in, in uh, within a 50-mile radius of, of uh, San Jose. Uh, it, this can, ac- this can ac- lead to accusations of, or maybe of Stanford, I should, maybe I should say, can ac- lead to accusations of, of Luddism. Seriously, I have fr- friends who are at Stanford and they go to cafes and they hear people talking about how they're, you know, they, they have a responsibility not only to disrupt, but then to reorganize the world that they have disrupted. Anyway, but accusations of Luddism are especially handy as a distraction from the real target of the most salient critiques of contemporary technology, the unprecedented... Comp- well, I'm saying things that you already know. Uh, here's a sentence that I published in my newsletter, and I created the newsletter in part because I had agreed to be quoted by Quanta which is an online science magazine. It's often qu- quite good. It's not science for the people, but it's, it's often uh, quite reliable. But I, but I agreed to be quoted on condition that this sentence be included. Uh, the original Luddite smashed machines that formed a new link in the chain leading to the production of clothing for the consumer market. What pure mathematicians find valuable about what we do is precisely that it provides a kind of understanding whose value is not determined by the logic of the market. And the sentence was in the, in the draft that was shown to me just before it was sent to proof and the following day it was published and it was not there. Why can that sentence not be published? And I tried several other venues. They said, well, no, you can't say things like that. What does that mean? That, that there may s- can still be an activity not determined by the logic of the market in this neoliberal age may seem scandalous but anyone who wants to avoid writing nonsense about the joint future of mathematics and computation will have to grasp this essential characteristic of the former, which, and if you believe that, that if, if you believe that I'm right about that, then you believe that, then you should believe that pretty much everything you're reading that is publishable about the future of mathematics and computation is nonsense. But you don't have to agree with me. So, so this, I think, maybe, let me just stop here, because probably this, I'm, I've been talking too much. Uh, crypto billionaire Charles Hoskinson a couple of years ago donated $20 million to Carnegie Mellon to, cre- to, it, to create something called <laughs> the Hoskinson Center for Formal Mathematics. I don't know whether he chose the name. Uh, to, and he inten- and intent- with the intention of inducing a paradigm shift. And this is it will keep growing in the endowment. He was, I heard that he was planning to, to donate up to $200 million, it's off the record, until it's an institute, and then eventually it will leave the safe harbor of Carnegie Mellon, go to Africa, go to Europe, go to South America, go to Asia, all around hundreds and eventually thousands of mathematicians or wannabe mathematicians will grow up that, with the tools built here, and a completely new language of mathematics will evolve, and so on and so forth. And what, why do... St- does a crypto billionaire want to create a paradigm shift in mathematics? Well, 
if you can formalize mathematics, if you can formalize proof, then you can formalize the proofs that people who claim to own so much Ethereum actually do own it, because as it is, human beings have to check the proofs. The proofs are unreliable. But if they are automatic and reliable, then this can all be mechanized. And so the, the people who own all this Bitcoin and Ethereum don't have to worry about other people stealing it from them. Okay, I think I, think I can stop here. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that was uh, extremely wide ranging. I had a lot of questions, and I feel like you touched on uh, a lot of them. So, uh, thanks for for that sort of run through there. Um, I guess actually, maybe my first question is is towards. Uh, um, also, if anyone else has questions, feel free to indicate. So, uh, I'm happy to to take some. Uh, but uh, I guess what what struck me is that. You know, as someone who studied math for mm-hmm. however many years in, mm-hmm. in, in undergrad and in grad school, uh, I knew of all these names of these radical. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. well, maybe I, did, I wasn't thinking about you know Hypatia so much, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> right. but certainly I, I, I remember reading about Smales results, mm-hmm. for instance, mm-hmm. and I never once had heard about any of these activities, right? Any of these sort of extra mathematical, mm-hmm. if, if 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 you will. Um, so, why is it that somehow? And maybe this is a problem with all sciences, uh, I, I can't say. But for, in math, at least, often the way we are taught, uh, uh, especially you know at the undergrad level, but e- even in the graduate level, is that results are sort of shown without any sort of historical context. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like you said, there, there's this sort of uh, this maybe platonic sense of well, the math was just out there and someone discovered it, and oh, it happened to be Stephen Smale, or mm-hmm. you know. There, um, often we even present works in ways that are very different than they looked uh, when they were mm-hmm. first discovered, mm-hmm. and say, for sake of clarity or sort of historical uh, rev- revisionism, whether good or bad. Um, sort of what, what is it about? Is it something about mathematics? And is there something that you think should be done for, in the sense of historical grounding, uh, contextualization, sort of, uh, fighting the depoliticization of of math, in in a sense. Well, first of all, I I found that uh, hi- historians of mathematics, and there aren't so many of them, but there are. Uh, there are more in, in in Europe than in the United States. Are very much aware of this radical history, and they are also, and possibly for this reason, they are much more likely to be seen at demonstrations or to be taking controversial stands that are controversial or, or, or not necessarily controversial so much among mathematicians, but willing to speak out. And there is a, a, a pressure to produce and competition and there's and, uh, in mathematics and It's, and it's, it is not limited by anything except the amount of time you're willing to put into it. It's not like a laboratory science where you actually have to wait for the experiment uh, to come out. And so um, the ethos, and especially in the United States, is do as much as you can, as quickly as you can. Don't think about anything else. Don't think about history. Don't think about uh, areas outside your own field. I believe... Uh, there is scope for change. I believe there is interest, but people have to have to mobilize, have to be willing to talk about it. Now, uh, there there was at a brief moment in the middle of 2020, uh, after the George Floyd murder and the, the time of the of the uh, mobilization, that uh, there was a call to shut down STEM. Uh, it started among astronomers, I think, or astrophysicists, and then it spread and just, just as part of the protest, just to shut down, shut down STEM for, uh, for a day, I think it was, or maybe two days. And the American Mathematical Society was not the first uh, professional organization of, in, the, in the area to, to join, but it wasn't the last either. And there were 
there were there were conversations, there were discussions, there were uh, online panels convened by the American Mathematical Society on, on, on these questions, on the, pro- on the problems, the, the political problems in the way mathematics is organized. And I think what you say, understanding the history would make it uh, much, uh, you know, it w- w- provides a, a, a very practical opening to talking about this. Because, you know, Galois was living at the, uh, at, at the, the time of uh, the restoration of the monarchy and the and before the 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 revolutions of around the revolution of of eighteen thirty he he went through the re- the, the the revolution of eighteen thirty he was killed before the revolution of eighteen forty eight mathematicians were part of the bourgeois revolution most most of the mathematicians of the time were you know they were not necessarily as outspoken as Galois, but they were on the side of what was the uh the 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 the, the cutting edge political movement of the time, and th- somehow maybe because France was so central in, in in all of these in all of these revolutions in the uh, in the nineteenth century, this is that may be why the 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, tradition has been preserved there. I should say that the there is a. Uh, a BDS organization in France of French academics. Now, in the United States, if you have uh, any any experience with that, you know that most of the members, the, uh, people who sign such statements, are uh, the humanities and social sciences, uh, history. In France, it's mostly mathematicians and physicists. At that I, that surprised me to to realize that. In fact, and in fact, the the uh, literary professors are often often very very backwards on on, on this issue in, in, in France. And so uh, it's so again. It, so the history is is I think uh, you know, familiarity with the history really can 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 uh, news change. I didn't finish the idea about the. Uh, the uh, what happened summer of 2020 because people graduated, people got jobs, the people who had been organizing the panels, and things basically petered out. But there is some residue, and I think it it can be revived with 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 some effort. Maybe just to uh, briefly comment uh, on that. I remember seeing uh, boycotts against or or you know. Um, movements against mathematicians, for instance, working with police departments Mm -hmm. uh, in this whole mess of uh, subject of predictive policing Mm -hmm. and then on all of these sort of uh, new emerging technologies, uh, as as people want to call Mm -hmm. them. Um, Yeah, there are, are, and of course, some, there are tech workers who are also uh, protesting that and protesting militarization of of technology. The... uh, you know, there, there. I should say there is a miss, a lost generation in 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 uh, in this country, among mathematicians, among scientists. The corresponds to the uh, disappearance of science for the people. You know, I was I was one of the younger uh, members of Science for the People when I was involved with that in the 1980s, and then you know, with the absence of, of uh, well, what, whatever the the fact that. You know, there was there was something called the end of history that may have contributed as well, uh, but with, there was no way, at least in this country, for people to express uh, in, in in the sciences to express uh, alternatives to the existing system. Right. Um, so, to go back to a point you made earlier mm-hmm. about uh, the pressures that that face for instance a grad student or a postdoc mm-hmm. or, or or anyone really going through this long march towards uh, mm-hmm. uh towards the 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 light at the end of the tunnel um one thing you you talk about uh in your book and that maybe we we didn't touch on here is the role um of the publishing industry which is you know mm-hmm. an, an immensely extractive industry mm-hmm. right i mean we all know whether you're a scientist or not uh probably familiar with the phrase uh publish or perish right if, if you're if you're not publishing in a sense you're not doing science is is sort of the uh the idea and 
you, you know, th this opens the way for, and, and actually I have a, a quote from, from your book, which I, I thought was quite interesting. Uh, you pointed out that commercial firms relative, were relative latecomers to scientific publishing and uh, are driven by economic goals increasingly incompatible with the budgets of the libraries on which the researchers depend in order to produce the articles that the publishers then sell back to them at a profit. Um, and maybe, you know, anyone who's been following the news recently, you might have seen, I think, in Nature, some publication of Nature, Nature News maybe it was, where uh, there were uh, 40 editors who resigned from uh, the board of a journal, so or two journals. So 40 editors resigned from two leading neuroscience journals in protest against excessively high article processing charges dictated by the mm -hmm. publisher uh, Elsevier, if, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and I think it, it's interesting, especially because Elsevier holds a, a sort of spe special significance for, for mathematicians. They were sort of like the, the, the main sort of uh, big baddie about what, like 10 years ago, 11 years ago, mm. there was a, a big movement against uh, Elsevier in particular and other uh, uh, companies doing sort of similar extractive, uh, w with similar extractive uh, policies. And one thing I remember is, so I, maybe one question mm -hmm. uh, is sort of, where is that movement at now? But uh, one thing that was even more interesting was that I remember seeing at the time more radical questions being asked, not just, you know, let's not publish to Elsevier, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, um, I remember one thing that uh, I found fascinating was uh, Tim Gowers is, uh, led polymath project where mm -hmm. you know th there's this idea that maybe math can be done collaboratively and online after all you need a pen and paper right you don't often mm -hmm. need much more to do math mm -hmm. so uh, what if we set up platforms to do math in this radically collaborative you know radically sort of more equalized fashion uh, and it was really cool to see contributions towards mm -hmm. like the twin primes conjecture, mm -hmm. crucial proofs being embedded, you know, 200 pages down in a blog post, uh, comments of a blog post or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, or, you know, I, I think uh, your colleague, Johan de Jong's Stacks Project, mm -hmm. although which is admittedly much older than, than 2012, um, which is now, I think, something like an 8,000 page open source textbook on mm -hmm. algebraic geometry, uh, was, which was invaluable when, mm -hmm. when I was a grad student. So I think we, we saw a lot of these uh, very radical sort of pushing beyond the boundaries of standard mm -hmm. ideas of publishing. Mm -hmm. And so I was, one, uh, I was wondering if you could give us a sense of, you know, what, what happened to that movement? Did we get sort of open access articles and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's it? And it, and it it's out? still, you know, it's still a struggle. There is, uh, you know, there is... There are several different versions of open access. The argument was, and Tim Gowers started this. Uh, I was then there was a uh, there was a, I, I ended up on, on the discussion, and then there was a letter uh, and a called the cost of knowledge statement. Cost of knowledge statement. I was one of the people who signed that, and so I was involved. And there were, it was there was a group in France that was particularly involved, and we've even met at a certain point and uh there are several kinds of of uh open access one of them nobody pays the uh or the or the that is to say not, not nobody pays but the institutions uh that is to say the governments that, that support higher education and research pay uh the costs and own everything and then it's distributed for free then there's another version where the authors pay. And when the, the authors pay for... Now, for uh, laboratories in the life sciences, the cost publication charges have... Page charges have been around for a long time. They, first of all, their articles are not very long. And they, the, they have enormous laboratory budgets. So page charges are, 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 are a minuscule fraction of that. So that they... Uh, mathematics is not like that. The pay articles are long, and there are no, there is no equipment, there are no uh, lab animals, and so, so uh, it's it's a bad model. And so various various uh, experiments have been tried. Uh, Gowers himself and some of the people who were involved with that started a version that is of the latter form. That is to say, the authors have to pay page charges, but it's published by Cambridge University Press, which is 
a non nonprofit, and therefore the page charges are not nearly as high as what Elsevier would be charging. Um, there is, in France as always, there is a uh, an an experiment called. It's basically an overlay. Uh, there's no there's no physical publication. There's an online publication, and but the articles are sent to the referees who check that they're right because in, the, the, the process in mathematics is that somebody has to read it and see that the arguments are correct. I was at a discussion uh, when they were talking about the Cambridge University Press uh, version where it was proposed that all publication would be online. As it is, the the articles, people mostly put their articles online before they're published in, in something called the archive. And somebody from Cambridge University Press said, but then what would happen to the journal hierarchy? And this is an important feature because you, it's, not, it's not just a matter of getting something published. You know, where you publish, and this is true in any field, but in mathematics, it, it's, uh, it's particularly the case, where you publish determines where, you're, where you stand among uh, among mathematicians, you know how, and you know, there's great competition to publish in the in the uh, most prestigious journals. And I cannot deny that I am uh, fully a part of this. And you know why they, they, they when they ask me for an opinion, I say, "Is this for this?" I'm not going to. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I could, I could uh, uh, try to to uh, withdraw from the process, but it's uh, you know it's a it's a complicated. It's a complicated question. Anyway, but that's that's the case. Where's the journal hierarchy? There's a, a bad idea was was proposed briefly, uh, which was that they should be uh, graded by likes. So 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 if if uh, you know the articles are published online, and then you know the the articles with the most likes would be. You know, a like would would mean that somebody read it and thought it was it was it was good. Uh, but you know that that one was not that one was not adopted. Um, there, uh, one more point. I have not given up, so, some of the people who were most active at the time, Gowers and others, are also very keen on uh, mechanizing mathematics on on uh, having math proofs verified by computer or having computers create the proofs. And that slide actually is part of an attempt on my part uh, to convince them that, and, and that, that in, entails in particular working with, with the big tech corporations and accepting money from, from uh, Microsoft and Google and so on. And this is part of an attempt on my part through my Substack newsletter to uh, Convince them that if they what if they believed what they said they believed at the time of the Elsevier boycott, which, uh, it's, which is still on by the way, I still boycott Elsevier, then they should also believe that there's a problem with their uh, with their working with these these big tech corporations. But I I could explain it, but we can go on to something else instead. Anyone have a question? One right here, perfect. Mm. Where's the la where's the labor organizing happening in the mathematics sector, right? Because at the end of the day, socialism is your relation to your work, and yet we opine so much about individual did this, individual did that. Where is the labor organizing? Great question. I even have an answer. It's an answer in several parts. So first of all, we've got their graduate student and postdoc union, uh, unionization efforts. They are, this is not something that at, 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 public, at, at private universities. At public universities, things like this were, all, were, hap were possible for a long time. And, and uh, labor unions do exist at, uh, it, in mathematics departments in public universities. The uh, Columbia unionized recently after more than a 10-year struggle. And it's, it's a movement that 
has really exploded in recent years. So that's one answer to the question, that there is, that people who are in this stage, at, at this, at this uh, point in their career, are organizing for specifically around labor issues. And the, and the, the, uh, the politics of these unions, not necessarily of the international, but, the, uh, but of, the, of the locals, is, is very much the sort of thing that we, we would like to see in, in Science for the People. What about professors organizing? Well, uh, I think it was in the 1980s, there was a, a case brought uh, to the Supreme Court called Yeshiva, the Yeshiva case that declared that professors at private universities do n are not uh, entitled to unionize under the National Labor Relations Act because they are management. And what does that mean, management? Well, it's absolutely the case, and this is why I was talking about mathematics as a post-capitalist activity, because we do have a great deal of uh, autonomy in the organization of our relations. And, there, and you know, with, within a mathematics department, relations are normally pretty democratic. Uh, you know, there are, and if somebody does, if somebody tries to take power, that usually is, is blocked by, by, by the others. Uh, but we are not allowed to, we are not allowed to unionize because we're management. On the other hand, uh, and this is in, in Colombia where, you know, the conditions are, are, are frankly pretty good, uh, we, the, the, the uh, administration is organized in such a way that it is very, very difficult for the faculty to uh, even to know how decisions are made, much less to, to, to take part in, in making decisions. So uh, it's not, la labor organizing is not an option uh, for mathematics professors in the United States. It definitely is in France. There are, la la there are unions. Uh, there the problem is that uh, the unions are totally uh, ineffectual. Uh, they go out to, they do, they're good at organizing demonstrations. They're good at printing leaflets. They're good at, at uh, printing their programs. The programs are not based on, on their accomplishments because they don't have any, but they are based on what they would, what they would, what they would like to do. And now that's a, that's a problem with, with, with uh, the, the, the conjuncture, the labor conjuncture in France uh, altogether because, uh, you know, it's basically been, uh, since I arrived in France and, ev and a bit before, it's basically been uh, uh, defending, defending uh, uh, benefits and gains rather than uh, trying to win new gains. Uh, it's, and it's, or reduce or minimizing the losses, really, over the past uh, 30, 40 years. Add uh, one small thing. I, I think you mentioned earlier this this funny reversal of uh, you know um, sort of the humanities being the most sort of class conscious mm. perhaps here, mm -hmm. and with it being opposite uh, in France, for instance. Um, I remember back when uh, Northwestern was was starting to to really push. You know, the grad students were really starting to push for for a union. Um, it was quite difficult to get. I remember math, like mathematics students interested at all. Um, I think in many ways, math is, is quite cushy. I mean, uh, unless, you know, uh, maybe you're a grad student at Columbia and they just don't pay you anywhere near enough to get by, which I certainly remember was the case uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I, I think often there is no sense, partly maybe because uh, students in mathematics are so siloed from the other sciences. It's not very interdisciplinary, t typically. We don't really understand um, the material experiences in a lab, right? Or, um, you know, sort of these complicated relationships with grants and PIs and stuff like that. Often math is, is pretty simple and, and cut and dry and often quite uh, democratic internally. Um, and so there, there's often, I think, even just apathy among people in in math because they the students sort of uh, again and, and maybe this also ties back into this notion of math being very sort of objective and, and platonic and there's often the historical context of, of what we think about is is cut out but there's 
there's often this sort of apathy I, I've found uh, that gets it a little difficult to, to organize with math students. Well, there's another factor, which is that the majority of, uh, of uh, math students in most departments are not from, from this country and are uh, n not necessarily tied in with the political uh, movements at all in, uh, in this country. And so they're so somewhat feeling isolated in general. Uh, and they don't have, you know, their, their training is not in politics. Their training is in mathematics, right? Uh, and I guess I should add that uh, the major although the, there was never, never there was never a, 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 a poll, I'm pretty sure that the majority of my colleagues in my department were not sympathetic to the union. But that's also a generational question. I think the younger ones probably almost certainly were. Um, I would just like to strongly contest the proposition that labor organizing is not an option, as you put it, mm -hmm. for mathematics professors. Good. Um, yeah. Well, to start with, most, um, uh, I think a fairly large majority of college and university faculty across the board in all fields in this country work at public institutions, mm -hmm. which the, um, um, you know, the NLRB decision you referred to does not cover. Well, I did um, say that. I yeah, I know, but so I'm making a point that I mm -hmm. think it, it follows from, mm -hmm. from that, from that mm -hmm. what you said is, is, is not true. But also I just decided, I, I, for Michael and I are friends, so he knows this, but for mm -hmm. FYI, he was for 15 years newspaper editor for the Teachers Union local at CUNY. Mm -hmm. But um, the, um, the fact that some um, private faculty currently, um, do, our full-time college faculty, don't have the protection of federal labor law to organize at private institutions doesn't mean they can't do it. Nobody's going to be put in jail for doing it. They're free to do it. Um, also, it, I would say that that's not etched in stone. It's certainly not a natural or mathematical law. It's the result of an administrative decision, very similar to the decision that's gone back and forth a few times as to whether uh, graduate students are simply receiving a form of training for which they get a stipend or are they in fact wage workers who have a right mm -hmm. to organize so this should be seen as something in contention rather than not an option mm -hmm. i would say, i don't want to be unrealistic i think it's pretty clear and many folks in this room who may work professionally in the field may know more in more deeply in the marrow of their bones than i do that there are profound ideological obstacles to the organization of full-time college uh, and university mathematicians as workers. Um, I, I mean, in a nutshell, and probably not news to anybody in this room, what I've experienced that, that as is mostly, um, and it wasn't necessarily always the dominant thing in people, but it's certainly a major force within the profession in conflict with others, um, is the individualization of people's career paths, the, you know, the key to success is my ideas, you know, my individual insight um, and that that tends to that and all the other kind of hierarchical organization of power and influence together sort of conspire to, you know, privilege or foreground uh, that, that way of thinking. Um, it does seem to me, though, that that probably suggests whatever kind of um, labor organization of, math of mathematicians around their, around their wage labor is not so likely to come from things that are unique about the role of mathematicians, but rather what they have in common with other education workers. Hmm. Well, I can see there, there were instances where mathematicians organized as a na on the national scale. There was back, back, back in the 1980s, there was <coughs> the Strategic Defense Initiative, and the American Mathematical Society did uh, eventually make, take a stand. They polled the members, and the majority was against it. So they did not want to be any to take be part of the of uh, Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative. If there is a, an explicit question, uh, you know, that where, where people are called upon to uh, to take a position, I think it's. Uh, most likely that uh, mathematicians will 
take a position and, and organize in some in some sense through the professional organizations. And um, I, but you can tell me whether the mathematicians at CUNY were, since you were, you were there and you were the editor, were uh, particularly visible in the labor struggles. Less so, not, not absent, but less so. Mm. Yes, he said less so. Not absent, but less so. There's you, you. Oh, there's a microphone? Or should I? Just point of fact, the mathematicians from the community colleges took leading roles. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. There you go. I wasn't here at the time, so... Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, all my friends are speaking up. It's, uh, hi, hi. Thanks a lot uh, for the. I, I think it's really refreshing to see that there's actually a, a scientist that also political activist. Uh, so thanks for for reminding us of that. So uh, just to quickly say where I'm talking from, I'm, I'm a professor at NYU. I works in robotics, so I actually do mm -hmm. terrible things. Uh, <laughs> mm, well, I yes, mean, uh, yes, and uh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> just because uh, the question I'm going to ask you actually is a question I'm asking myself. So maybe I hope maybe you have an answer. Um, so I've noticed in your presentation you show mathematicians to do mathematical research and also at the same time political activists. Mm -hmm. And then you showed um, mathematical research that has questionable applications. Mm -hmm. But you did not show necessarily mathematical research that maybe can help uh, progress towards you know anti-capitalist <laughs> world and things like that. And um, and in the radical people that you showed, you I was surprised you didn't show Alexander Crotan. Yeah, well, we could talk. Who, <laughs> who actually took the most radical step? Maybe she stopped doing mathematics because he thought it was not compatible with the uh, the kind of um, world you wanted to live in. I mean, I I, mm -hmm. I, I uh, exaggerated a bit by that. Do you think there is actually a mathematical practice or a, a practice that involves technology? that can be also uh, aligned with uh, anti-capitalist goals? Or are we doomed to um, always work for powers if we <laughs> do that? And I'm sorry, I know it's a question that does no, has no answer probably, but I would mm -hmm. know it, like to know your answer. Well, OK, there, there, are, two, there are two points. I mean, I'm not going to talk about Groton Deek, because he always, everybody should know about Groton Deek. And you can actually read an essay about him in the New Yorker, published last year. The, that one of the most uh, unusual and inspiring characters, also uh, a little bit uh, disconcerting, in of, of uh, the last century. Uh, two things. First, I had more slides that do show uh, mathematicians who are working for uh, positive goals, climate, and so not 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 anti-capitalist specifically, but but uh, uh, a, a, you know, think Im improving I improving uh, society I in general. Now, there's Tom Hales, whom you saw with, who explained the the uh, back door in the uh, in, in the in the crypto system. S established a prize called the Bertrand Russell Prize for mathematicians uh, that just with it's, it's, it's run by the American Mathematical Society and it is for people who do work of, of, of social, social value. And the first one was given to a woman named uh, Christiane Rousseau who works on, on, on climate questions. And I have that, had those slides as well, but I didn't include that. The second one it seems like there are a lot of French people, though. It's 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 uh, Michel Valschmidt who who has uh, for decades organized international exchanges, in particular with with countries that were uh, being penalized for one reason or another for their failure to to uh, adapt to the uh, the new world order. So there's so th so this is that's one another example. The other part of the answer is that uh, the kind of mathematics I do is not. Uh, can, uh, is not relevant to applications, and it's not because I don't want it to be. I mean, it, I don't wouldn't mind if there were some applications, but it's, that's first of all, it's it's very unlikely. 
Secondly, it's not the purpose. And third, I really don't like uh, the uh, obligation when asking for funding to say, this is, w or, or even when you meet somebody in an airplane, say, what is this good for? You know, to say, well, because at some point it will, it will, uh, allow, you, it will allow you to edit your genes or something. It's a, uh, you know, this, this is, of course, how funding is, is motivated at the government level, and there's, you know, there's no way around it. But I think that if you want to examine this, uh, uh, if you want to examine this, uh, th thinking clearly, and this is why I was talking about post-capitalist, the whole point of doing mathematics, uh, the value, special value of mathematics, is that it does not create something for the market. Now, obviously, people want to want to make uh, the world a better place. But the idea that every, every activity has to create something that can be uh, that can be embedded in, in commercial relations is an extremely unhealthy. And that's that was the, that was what uh, Marx was saying in the Poverty of Philosophy. This is what capitalism. This is what capitalism creates. This is an attitude that capitalism creates, and it's very difficult to think outside of of, of that relation. So, when I say that mathematics is a post-capitalist activity, it's not just because when every when we when when we no longer have to work, then we'll all start thinking about uh, about differential equations it's it's uh, spontaneously it's that it's an activity that does not require a justification uh, through its insertion in, in in the market so that was that was the, the part of the answer I find it very difficult to to formulate and it's interesting that people in the humanities in this in this country anyway talk about the value of studying literature and they don't say it's because you know you're going to be able to write a better resume or 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 uh, you'll be able to write copy for an advertising agency you know they they say you know they they talk about uh human flourishing right well not every I, I understand that not everybody is going to flourish by doing mathematics even even in post capitalist utopia but still it is an aspect of, of human flourishing that deserves to be uh, un that deserves to be supported, and it's an, an example for, to the extent that it can be made less hierarchical. If I might just add two small things to that. Um, uh, first is a very concrete thing, which isn't really radical, and the, and the second is more sort of speculative. The so the the first one being, and again I, I agree with Michael. It's it's often quite difficult to find. Uh, applications of pure mathematics for social good just because applications of pure mathematics is often a contradiction in terms but uh one project i remember finding quite interesting is uh, i think based at tufts i believe there's uh mm -hmm. there's a group called um the metric geometry and gerrymandering group if, if i'm remembering that correctly and it's uh, a very interesting attempt to uh, understand gerrymandering from a mathematical perspective involving metric geometry and probability theory, uh, roughly speaking. I, I hope I'm not totally making this up, but if I, if I remember correctly, it was something like, you know, let's say we need to district Wisconsin. Let's draw, you know, let, let's try to look at all possible districtings of Wisconsin subject to certain political social constraints, and then compare it to the one that actually ended up being passed by the state legislature and figure out how crazy is that compared to the sort of bulk of uh, the set of all redistrictings. So that's maybe a small, you know, th there's certainly some very inventive and, and interesting um, approaches, but I, I, I'm unfortunately not super educated uh, on that front. I have, just those were in the, some of the slides too. Oh, excellent. I have Moon Duchin at, uh, at Tufts and using geometry and John Mattingly using statistics at Duke, another one. Yeah, so I think, and then maybe a more speculative one. Uh, I'm always reminded somehow of, uh, of Project Cybersyn, right? Uh, and, and Chile and, and this idea that, you know, um, this sort of speculative idea of, of using the power of computing, using the power of planning, economics, simulation, uh, to organize an economy uh, in some radically sort of, uh, you know, grassroots fashion 
and uh, certainly there would be mathematics involved there. I don't know if it would be pure mathematics at all, but just a speculative thing I love to keep in the back of my head. I want to make another point because there were some, uh, John Mattingly is, is a professor at Duke in North Carolina, and you may have heard about gerrymandering in North Carolina. And I did say that mathematics, the, the ideology of mathematics is objectivity. That is to say, if the results are established by mathematics, then they have to be true. Now, that works when the results are aligned with the interests of the people in power. When the uh, results come out opposite to what the North Carolina legislature wants to vote, then all of a sudden they don't have to pay attention. And it, so it's, uh, that, that's, a, that's an important fact to keep in mind. D asks, Luddite dismissal of capitalist tech is not new, as in Science for the People's historic work on nuclear energy and war. Can you lay out parallels of scientism's pivot to nuclear and AI, et cetera, for new activists? Well, I'm not sure I'm really the person to talk about uh, scientism and nuclear. I don't, have, I don't have the historical background. And I, you know, scientism in AI, uh, what's meant by scientism is... is the, the assumption that that that, that uh, there is an objective way of describing the world that is and that science provides that objective uh, has it has an objective means of verifying its its conclusions and, and so on now that is very much part of the argument in Silicon Valley for uh, their right to disrupt because they are scientists. They know how things work. They know that thinking is 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 uh, information processing. Information is data. Data are bits, and they know how to process bits. And therefore, they should be allowed to disrupt everything. You know that's part of it. Also, you know they they're very rich, and therefore the fact that they're very rich is another scientific proof that they have uh, that they've been they've been making the right decisions. Um, that I think that is a, that is actually quite difficult to combat uh, the idea that, but that's partly because they have such powerful uh, public relations. The uh, there are a lot of people who do not like the idea that uh, that Silicon Valley is actually going to disrupt everything and provide paradigm shifts uh, for, for, for every question. Um, and fortunately, within the tech industry itself, there are people who are questioning these. They actually they, they look at the, at the effects and not just at the ideology. So I think a question that's come up, I guess, in multiple different ways um, has been the idea of individual responsibility and collective responsibility. Um, and I guess as a professor at Columbia, you probably are aware of this, but um, you know, you train so many undergraduates and then when you look at who shows up to their career fairs, it's um, people like the Army Corps, um, Raytheon, the Institute for Defense Analysis, um, and big financial institutions, and we as students talk about taking a job there as kind of selling out. Uh, so there's this kind of collective understanding that working for bad people is not something that we would like to do, mm -hmm. um, but that it's something that is done. Um, and a lot of people rationalize this or justify it with the idea of, I'm only gonna work there for 20 years and then I'll get out. I'll only work there for so long and I'll get out, or I'll do philanthropy on the side, you know, effective altruism. Um, and there are kind of a lot of ways that we as students add like <laughs> moral qualifiers to our decisions that we make in, in terms of our career. Um, so I guess, but it's kind of frustrating to see this happening um, and to think that there's not really a progression past, um, you know, you can't necessarily have an ethical career under capitalism to like, we need to question and change the order. There seems to be this kind of like um, stagnation where we, we're, we as students understand and have been 
our understanding has been radicalized, but our actions have not necessarily been. And I don't know, um, I guess, as an individual, as a student, as a member of that community, how to help push us to the point that we can understand that you know our careers won't necessarily be ethical, but we can change the system. That, like, I, I, I guess I just don't know how to reach that next step. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, of course, I have thought about this question. I certainly don't have an answer. Grotendieck, who was mentioned before, did choose uh, to drop out, essentially. So he became a, a school teacher. I mean, he was he was a teacher. He was teaching mathematics at the university, but not he, he but in a very in a very obscure way. And then eventually he dropped out completely, became a hermit. And that I think is not uh, is is not uh, the only option. You know, uh, the uh, every every all I can say is that everybody. The, the, the most important thing is to be aware. Everybody has to make compromises at some point because that's the that's the the world in which we live, and you know one wants to change it, but one, but you can't change it if if you if you're not part of it. And so you have to make compromises, and at, at all points you have to be conscious of what your compromises are, and whenever you see an opportunity uh, to to change things, then then you take that. that that's why I wrote that. That piece do mathematicians have responsibilities because say recognize they're working it's not it just even wh when it, whether or not my students will go into uh, into finance right, or into the military or, or both you know if I'm just being at an elitist institution you know which per, which uh, perpetuates a uh, 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 social hierarchy and and, and maintains uh, the for, for the means of reproduction of uh, of the status quo. That that's also a com uh, compromise, and uh, and so you know the obligation is to speak out whenever possible. I would I would maybe uh, if I could be so arrogant as to say this is I think one of the great failings of of the the profession of mathematics, uh, which is. That we, I mean, everyone knows, right? There's not enough faculty positions for math PhDs to become faculty, so they've got to go somewhere, right? And uh, I think, you know, I, I don't know. I, I wonder, Michael, what's your, what's your, because as you've said, when pressed, mathematicians are often uh, sympathetic with these mm -hmm. views, right? Mm -hmm. Of boycotting, uh, mm -hmm. working for the NSA, or, or mm -hmm. calling out the the quant farms. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be possible, you know? To see organization of those in power, faculty, um, you know, pe people who who can decide where students go, to sort of collectively, you know, work to collectively try to find new paths for for students. I don't know whether that would look like, you know, more interdisciplinary work with other, you know, for instance, nowadays we see a lot of mathematicians going into bioinformatics and genetics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I, I wonder, do you see that as feasible as? Uh, you know the, the those in power, the, the faculty who ultimately do want the best for their students, to to work to create new pathways. However, those might be found for students, um, because everyone knows, you know, math, physics, even are are often quant farms, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, let's say I do not have that much hope for my generation. But you know that's uh, times change, right? So I think I think as long as as these ideas are kept in circulation, I, they will. Uh, and especially given given the visible failings of the uh, of the system as a whole, I think more and more people are going to feel uh, they have to they have to uh, become active. That it's they can't they, they can no longer just uh, pretend that it doesn't it doesn't affect them and also of course the sense that you act the sense that you can actually win something it's it's very important if you if you have uh, if you feel that it's hopeless anyway because you know uh, uh, Missouri or Supreme Court or whatever then then you know that's de demotivating uh, but um, 
I, th I think, I'm hopeful that more and more people will be getting involved because they have to, because they have no choice, because, because things are just getting so bad. And, uh, and so, so visibly bad. And then, you know, there will be some victories and that will, and that will motivate people to continue. wrap up any class or final comments from you both mm. well maybe i'll just sort of wrap up yeah, the, the okay. point you were just making i think this is a perfect uh ad for science for the people <laughs> to be quite honest i mean you know if, if any of this discussion strikes you as interesting um even if you're not necessarily a scientist right i'm no longer in academia for instance if you're an engineer plenty of engineers who, who are involved um, I, I think as long as you see that divide between, you know, where science needs to be, uh, to be, you know, put to, to, to use for pushing us forward, um, I, I think you'll find, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of community, uh, a lot of interesting discussions like this one. And, uh, I believe we have a chapter meeting tomorrow, uh, here at the people's forum. Um, uh, so definitely reach out to Kiara, for instance, if, if you're interested. Um, but I, I think that's, that's the way to go. You know, how, how do, how do we get these small wins? We have to start somewhere. We have to start with organizing, agitating, getting people to ask these questions. Right. And so I guess like, this is the time for me to, to suggest that science for the people have an issue that has articles about mathematics in it because I don't think that's that's happened in a very long time. So, uh. Huge thank you to Michael and Eli for this really amazing um, conversation. I don't think I've ever been so interested in math. <laughs> like I was really there. Thank you, um, this was this was amazing. I have lots of like I wrote down notes on the books that you've recommended on all these. Thank you really for a really detailed and just informative um, talk. And thank you to all of you, our folks in person and online, for joining us today. Um, when it comes time to build our post-capitalist society, I'm going to be calling on all of us because we've had this amazing time um, as to how we could mathematically build that world. So thank you for that. Um, as I had mentioned, the People's Forum is a space for political education or cultural work, and we have a lot more opportunities like this, so don't worry. The education's not done yet. Um, this weekend, we have a class on popular Palestinian resistance, so definitely check it out. Um, the second week of June, we have a class on Korea and the Korean liberation struggle as well as we just launched our Revolutionary Summer School, and this year we're studying Pan-Africanism as a political, like historical and contemporary project that for many, and for all of us, truly is a path to liberation. So I encourage you to check out a lot of our programming and courses, and of course, check out Science for the People, a really amazing organization that I'm uh, very, very honored and happy to work with. Um, and we have some, as I mentioned, some of the sponsoring organizations for this seminar. Uh, capitalism, Nature, Socialism. We have some of their journals downstairs. So actually, I'll bring them up if you want to hang around for a minute. Feel free to take them, read them through. Another great um, resource. Uh, yeah, so a huge thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you again soon. Oh, oh, well, <coughs> well, well, you know, you, you sent the list of four questions.